Hi, Jane Schnupp here. Welcome to another of the new Savvy Sightseer video vacation series. Today, we are off to Scotland. When I was considering where to travel recently, someone suggested I watch the Outlander series on Stars or on library DVDs to get a sense of the beautiful Highland scenes that helped make the books and TV series such a hit. I did, and I got hooked immediately on both the story and the country, and the decision where to go was made. For those unfamiliar with Outlander, the show is based on a hugely popular series of books by Diana Gabaldon. It's a compelling story on many points. It's part time travel, love and revenge, as well as political drama, all woven around historical events. The story's success is based on accepting the illogical, that falling through a mysterious circle of stones up in the highlands, home to the Celtic lore and superstitions, a former army nurse passes through time from 1945 to 1743. Smart and resourceful, the lead character Claire quickly realizes she hasn't come upon a reenactment, but rather a real confrontation between English soldiers and Scots. She manages to hide her circumstances from the Scottish clan and hero Jamie, who take her in. Her observations open a portal for the 21st century readers and viewers to experience the Scotch culture and people, clan life, survival without electronics or antibiotics, and the fierce nationalism that led Scots into the doomed Jacobite rebellion or rising against the Protestant English rule in the 1740s. The clans had united and fought to restore exiled Catholic Prince Charles Edward Stuart, known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, to the Scottish throne, and in the end, they lost everything. Their independence, clans, language, tartans, their very way of life. Join me now as we visit these interesting, beautiful, and historic places. Whether a fan or not of the series, you'll enjoy the country's many sides and sights, old and new. We're going to start at the east coast of Scotland with Edinburgh, which has been its capital since 1437. Archaeologists have found evidence of settlements here as far back as 900 BC. One part of the castle complex dates back to the 12th century. This has always been a contested piece of land between the English and the Scots. Battles were fought over the strategic position which is high on a volcanic rock. Mary Queen of Scots' great, great, great grandson, Charles Edward Stuart, that's the Bonnie Prince Charlie, captured Edinburgh but not the castle during the 1746 Jacobite Rising. Bronze statues of two of Scotland's hero freedom fighters flank the main entrance. Sir William Wallace on the right, questionably portrayed by Mel Gibson in Braveheart, was the first leader of the Scots to rebel against King Edward I of England when he had overrun Scotland in 1296. Wallace died a martyr to the cause. But Robert the Bruce, on the left side of the entrance, fought Edward again and in 1306 declared himself King of Scotland. The castle is quite a varied history. Witches were burnt at the stake here. About 300 women, more witches than anywhere else in the country during the 16th century. It became a military prison for an estimated more than 1,000 prisoners of various British wars. From 1689 to 1753, Hundreds of Jacobites were imprisoned here, some for years, some were eventually executed, and some were sold to work on American plantations. American rebels were held here from 1776 to 1781. A defiant American revolutionary even carved an early American flag in a door. This version of the Stars and Stripes is one of the earliest known depictions of the American flag in Britain. The Stone of Destiny, or the Stone of Scone, or some say the Stone of Scone, is a powerful and ancient symbol of Scottish monarchy. It was used for the coronation of its kings for centuries. But after his victory in 1296, Edward, who became known as the Hammer of the Scots, confiscated it and took it to Westminster Abbey in London. Ever since, English rulers have been crowned in a coronation chair specifically designed to hold the stone. On Christmas Day in 1950, four Scots students sneaked in and grabbed the stone. How do you exactly grab a 336-pound stone? I don't know. But they did, and they brought it back and hid it in Scotland. A few months later, it was found and taken back to Westminster Abbey. It was last used at Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953. 
In 1996, in a gesture to shore up unity with Scotland, the stone was sent to Edinburgh and put in the castle's crown room. It stays there still, with the agreement it will be lent to Westminster for future coronations. With secession talk bubbling up, we'll see what happens. As they say, possession is nine-tenths of the law. St. Margaret's Chapel is the oldest surviving building in Edinburgh. It was added to the castle complex in the early 1100s and was named for the mother of King David I, who ruled at the time. When the Scottish army laid siege against the castle in 1314, King Robert the Bruce ordered every building at the complex be destroyed, except this one. Now royalty has much more posh digs downhill from the castle, called the Palace of Holyrood House. It started as an abbey in 1128. In the late 15th century, James IV expanded and converted it to a palace. One of the most famous residents of the palace was James V's daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots. She came to live there in 1561, but fled after only four years when her secretary and rumored lover was brutally killed in her chambers. Pregnant, she bolted and eventually landed up at Edinburgh Castle, where she gave birth to James VI of Scotland, who later ruled both England and Scotland as James I. In the 1920s, the Palace of Holyrood House was formally designated as the monarch's official residence when in Scotland. The palace is open to the public to visit Mary's historic chambers, the state apartments, the abbey rooms, and the royal gardens, except when the queen's flag is flying. That means she's at home, so no peasant visitors. That's usually around the end of June, beginning of July. Scotland has been cashing in on the Outlander's popularity. Tours of filming sites and key points in Edinburgh popped up all over the city. There was even a walking tour of Holyrood House, focusing on the prince's movements there in September 1745, when the Jacobite army took the Scottish capital. Charlie had set up court in the palace. The Royal Mile, actually is just a little more than a mile, connects the castle to the palace. If you take away the cars and the paved road, it hasn't really changed much over the years. Some sections are still all cobblestone. Today, the street is largely filled with souvenir shops. But while many tourists stick to shopping the main drag, they miss some more interesting sights. Many of these sort of tunnels are easy to overlook between shops. They are called closes, gated entryways to private property that were closed and locked to the public for security at night. Inside opens up to courtyards and buildings, such as this bakehouse close from 1521, where you'll find perhaps the best preserved old town close. A visit here gives a good impression of what living in the old city must have been like. This should look familiar to anyone who saw season three and Jamie's printing place. Canongate Kirk, Kirk is their word for church, was founded in 1688 and is with so many places in Europe, amazes me that it is still used for the purpose for which it was built. Worship sh services are held every Sunday. Surrounding the church is a cemetery, the resting place of several Edinburgh no notables, including economist Adam Smith and David Rizzio, the murdered private secretary of Mary, Queen of Scots. 19th century author Charles Dickens wrote in his diary that he took a stroll around Canongate when he was in the city for a lecture. He said he had seen a headstone for Ebenezer Lennox Scroggy, a meal man. Dickens, who reportedly had dyslexia, mistook this for a mean man, but it was really a reference to Scroggy's occupation as a corn or meal merchant. Dickens wondered why the late Ebenezer would be forced to bear such a cheerless nickname for all eternity. That gravestone gave Dickens the basis for what would become one of his most famous characters in A Christmas Carol. The Tollbooth Jail was built in 1591 and had many functions. It was a courthouse, a jail, and a town council meeting place. However, there were so many escapes that it led to the jailer James Park and his assistant being sent to prison there themselves in 1681. Today, the toll booth is open as a museum called The People's Story, and it tells the history of ordinary Edinburgh folk over hundreds of years. It even has a reconstructed jail cell so you can imagine how you could have escaped. In 1884, the clock was added, sticking out into the Royal Mile on brackets, giving the building a very characteristic silhouette. I couldn't help but wonder how the 
Outlander film crew would handle the clock, which would not have been around in the late 1700s. I was very impressed they paid attention to this little detail and thought to digitally erase the clock. Any city as old as Edinburgh has interesting stories and legends. For example, there's Deacon Brody, who lived an amazing double life near this tavern, today named for him. By day, William Brody was a respectable cabinet maker and town council member and deacon, or head of a major trade group. But unknown to residents, he had a secret nighttime job as a leader of a gang of burglars. He needed the extra income to support his extravagant lifestyle, which included two mistresses, numerous children, and a nasty gambling habit. His day job involved making and repairing security locks, which gave him the opportunity to copy his client's door keys. Brody'd managed the, to maintain the illusion of being a respectable craftsman right up until his arrest. He was 47 when he was hanged in 1788, ironically on gallows that he'd designed. In a way, though, he still lives on today. Brody's double life was the inspiration for Edinburgh author Robert Louis Stevenson's infamous character, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Edinburgh was for centuries a walled city. The gates to the city were situated outside this pub, so this was the end of the world for the locals. It's prominently featured in Outlander, and Claire remarks it hosted a mix of soldiers, war rats, war rats laborers, and apprentices. Back in the 18th century, pub drinkers throughout the town would hear a call to close, a tattoo, a word derived from a term for a drumbeat that signaled it was time for the pubs to turn off their taps and send those soldiers back to the barracks. Today's Royal Edinburgh military tattoo still draws people to the castle. Up to 200,000 people for the annual three-week event held every August since 1950. The town becomes a hub of activity at the time, which is why I went in June instead. Performers from over 48 countries come for a celebration of music, dance, military pageantry, all that focuses on the heritage, color, and diversity of Scots from all around the world. A showstopper is always a major fireworks display. That's fitting since Edinburgh Castle was the location in 1507 of the first ever recorded use of fireworks in Scotland. In 2017, they marked a historic change. At the tattoo, 57 clan chiefs were invited to lead their clansmen and members from around the world to take part in the opening ceremony. It's the first time Scotland's clans were invited and openly welcomed into the castle since their attempted siege in 1745. I am sad to report that because of the pandemic, the 2020 grand 70th anniversary of the tattoo has been canceled. That's the first time this has ever been done. And far from being banned, the pla plaids are proudly worn today. There's a little confusion about the terms, tartan, kilt, and plaid. A tartan is a pattern that's perfectly symmetrical. The plaid is a huge fabric from knee to waist with a long piece worn over the shoulder. It's called a great kilt. And typically that's what our hero, Jamie Frazier, wore when the film was in Scotland. And a kilt is a plaid without the shoulder piece. In 1997, the U.S. Congress designated April 6th as National Tartan Day, a day for celebrating Scottish heritage and pride. In 2018, New York City marked the 20th anniversary of its annual National Tartan Day Parade. I didn't know about this, and I had even grown up in the city. What's most fun and sometimes the best memory of a trip is when something happens that you couldn't predict. I just plain got lucky and caught this newly married Scottish couple coming out of the castle's St. Margaret's Chapel. It's a popular venue for Fathers of the Bride, since it only fits 25 guests, and so it keeps to the invite list small. Here's not a particularly important story, but one of my favorites about Edinburgh. In 1850, there was a night watchman, John Gray, whose constant companion on patrol was a little sky terrier called Bobby. Together, they were a familiar sight trudging through the old cobbled streets of, of Edinburgh, winter and summer. John eventually died in 1858 and was buried in Greyfriars Kirkyard. Bobby, though, refused to leave his master's grave, even in the worst weather conditions. He remained loyal to his master, and for 14 years, he kept constant watch and guard over the grave 
until his own death in 1872. Moving on over to Glasgow, Scotland's largest city, has reinvented itself multiple times. Glasgow is famous for the Victorian architecture of its many streets, squares, and historical monuments, especially here at George Square in the city center. Originally designed in 1781 to be a private garden for the surrounding elegant townhouses, it became a public center in mid-19th century. The Jacobite army stopped in Glasgow in 1745, during the time that it was a major textile center. While here, Charles demanded 15,000 pounds, but that was denied by the more loyalist Glaswegians. Yet he did get 12,000 shirts, 6,000 coats, and 6,000 pairs of stockings for his somewhat ragtag army. He also took advantage of its nightlife, attending Christmas balls and going out to dinner, as well as reviewing his troops on Glasgow Green. The square's dominant feature is at its center, an almost 80-foot tower in tribute to the native author Sir Walter Scott. He has connections not just to the Jacobites, but to Americans as well. One stanza of his narrative poem, The Lady of the Lake, was about the chief of a Highland clan who lost his life and the family territory in a battle against their enemy, King James V. The stanza was later set to music in a play, and that is what's played for American presidents, called Hail to the Chief. Just don't tell any president that he or she is not the chief being hailed in the song. Scott's is one of 12 monuments saluting Scottish stars from literary, political, and industrial sectors. Among these are the national poet Robert Burns, who we also pay a tribute to every single year when we sing one of his poems called Old Lang Syne. There's also Glasgow-born Thomas Graham, an acclaimed chemist who developed the process of dialysis. As mentioned, Glasgow has reinvented itself time and time again. Initially, it was famous as a center for religion and learning. St. Mungo is revered for founding a monastery here back in the 6th century, and thus the city of Glasgow that grew up around it. It is believed his gravesite is under the city's striking cathedral, which was built in the 1100s and became a mecca for devout religious pilgrims. It is Scotland's only intact medieval cathedral and the oldest building in Glasgow. It was spared destruction in the 16th century Reformation when parishioners formed a human wall linking arms against the destructive mobs. Service is still held here on Sundays at 11 o'clock, as well as a series of choral events. Imagine the acoustics with all that stone. Those of you who saw the second season of Outlander should recognize those soaring arches as the Parisian-based charity hospital where Claire had nursed with Sister Angelique. One of the four chapels in the lower church of the cathedral, the Chapel of St. Andrew, is dedicated to the nurses of Scotland. It was in this chapel that a very dramatic scene was filmed in season two. That's where Claire's stillbirth and recovery room was staged, and the church is all too happy to tout their association with the hit series. As a healer, Claire, as well as other Outlander characters, especially Galus, knew their herbs and flowers well. One mentioned often is foxglove. As you can see, it's a beautiful plant. It can be a lifesaver or a dangerous drug in the hands of those who know their plants. It flourishes everywhere. Another mentioned is nettles, and this can be used in recipes or for joint ailments or as a diuretic and even as an astringent. But when Jamie brushed one against Claire, she found out why they're called stinging nettles. Another abrasive plant mentioned is the thistle. Claire uses it for things like bringing down fevers. It's also the Scottish national flower and was said to have saved clansmen from an attack when a British soldier screamed after stepping on its thorny stems. Remnants of the era when kings and clans ruled the land are everywhere in Scotland. The best preserved relic from the early 12th century is Stirling Castle in the Central Highlands. A 10-year, 12 million pound restoration brought the fortress to its Renaissance glory. It is easy to imagine James V striding its halls or his daughter, Mary, on her way to being crowned Queen of the Scots. Almost every Scottish monarch either lived in the castle, was crowned, and or died here. During the rising of 1745, the castle was held by King George II's loyalists. 
the Bonnie Prince Charlie's army largely avoided conflict as he marched through the area on their way south to England. Returning north to Culloden, though, they did launch an assault on the castle, and it failed miserably. It was the last military assault on Stirling Castle. It's a, a, something to note here that this is a rare divergent from history in the Outlander book Dragonfly and Amber, where it's written that Stirling Castle fell at last. In reality, while the Jacobites did hold the town, it was their poor military strategy and leadership that led the siege to fail without them ever taking the castle. The distinctive yellow hue of the Great Hall stands out against the gray castle turrets. Inside the Great Hall, the, you can picture it filled with hundreds of people celebrating grandly staged festivities. 500 people could fit in here for an event. It was so large that a full-sized boat was once placed in the center to act as a serving buffet. The palace is loaded with statues. Some are remarkably grotesque sculptures with devils and odd animals. Several like this were placed around the outer wall, sending the message that James V meant business and could be a dangerous adversary. Unicorns, like these on Sterling's amazing seven-part tapestry called the Mystic Hunt of the Unicorn, factor prominently on Scottish royal crests. The unicorn is considered the national animal of Scotland. It symbolizes ruling through harmony and represents purity, benevolence, and virtue. Tapestries were decorative, and they kept the inhabitants warm. But for Charles V, Stirling served several purposes. His goal was to transform a simple castle into a royal palace to showcase his wealth, importance, and especially his entitlement to rule. It was certainly a daunting fortress, perched high above the town on volcanic rock with steep cliffs on three sides. Most importantly, he wanted it to be the envy of every other leader and showing off wall after wall covered in wildly expensive Belgian tapestries helped him to achieve that. An inventory shows he owned a hundred or more tapestries. One of the palace's most unique features is its collection of hand-carved oak medallions, known as the Sterling Heads. The originals, dating from the mid-1500s, decorated a ceiling of the king's inner hall with images of kings and queens and nobles, Roman emperors, and even characters from the Bible and classical mythology. The links between Stirling Castle and the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders reach back through hundreds of years. A depiction of the sword dance is displayed in the castle's regimental museum. The dance was featured in Outlander when Jamie's godfather, Murtagh, went looking for him. Clan chiefs had organized Highland games as a method to choose their best men at arms because the discipline required to perform these Highland dances allowed men to demonstrate their strength, stamina, and agility. Looking down from the ramparts, you find an oddly shaped mound called the King's Knot in what was once the Royal Gardens. Recent research by Glasgow University using modern technology indicates that hidden in the field, there's a circular stone table under that mound, and researchers contend it could be King Arthur's Round Table. This view from Stirling gives you a sense of the terrain the clans and armies dealt with. Stirling is considered the crossroads, where the low meet the highlands, from here, three pivotal battles for independence from England occurred. At Stirling Bridge, William Wallace defeated the Brits. At Falkirk, though, Wallace was defeated by the Brits. And at Bannockburn, Rob Roy beat down the Brits. Also, this is being used as a backdrop for the American scenes in Outlander, just as the French Charity Hospital was actually a cathedral in Glasgow. The setting for the scenes taking place now in South Carolina, USA, are generally shot in the woods around Stirling. 14th century Dune Castle has been a popular filming set. It's been used for Monty Python and the Holy Grail, as well as the Game of Thrones. On Outlander, it's a stand-in for Castle Leoc. Inside is one of the best preserved medieval halls in Scotland. In the series, the roof on the smaller wing to the right and the turret on top of the main building were digitally wiped out to make it more of a room in the 1940s scenes. And full turrets and roof were digitally inserted on the main building for the 1740s scenes. 
Dune was a Stuart stronghold in the 1300s for Robert, the Duke of Albany. It fell to ruin in the 18th century. This region was known for ornate pistols that were made here. George Washington owned some, and it is believed that the first shot fired in the American War of Independence was from a Dune pistol. The castle is several floors high, but the doorways are very low and narrow. A lot of scenes were shot around the courtyard. This is where Claire first enters the manor, as introduced to housekeeper Mrs. Fritz, and it's where we see characters Dougal and young Hamish playfully sparring. Another true life setting used for Outlander is at the Highland Folk Museum. Founded in 1935 by historian Isabel Grant, a Scot who wanted to preserve the Highland way of life, the museum has grown over the years from its humble start in an unused church to an outdoor park covering 80 acres in Newtonmore. There are over 30 buildings depicting Highland life from the 1700s on. The biggest draw of the park for Outlander fans is the Highland Township section, where many scenes have been filmed. Especially easy to recognize in season one, this is where Claire goes on a rent-collecting trip with Dougal. This is Weeping Glencoe Valley. Its 300 waterfalls are a personification of the tears shed here, the site of a 1692 massacre of the Clan Macdonalds by the Clan Campbells. The Clan Campbell was one of the largest and most powerful and notorious of the clans. Their worst exploit to most was in 1692, when after two weeks of enjoying the Highland hospitality of the Clan Macdonald, they turned on their hosts and massacred 38 of the clan. Another 40 would die of exposure while on the run. The Campbells were part of the Black Watch, a Scottish infantry regiment in, British, in the British Army. They were charged with retaliating against the Macdonalds on grounds that they hadn't been prompt enough in pledging their allegiance to the new monarchs, William and Mary. Much of the distance between Glencoe and Inverness is along the scenic shores of Loch Ness, one of Scotland's longest lakes at about 24 miles. It beats out nearby Loch Lomond by a mere 50 feet. Lomond is south of Glencoe in the Trossachs National Park, and it's the region where Sir Walter Scott was moved to set that poem, The Lady of the Lake. Lomond also inspired another song, The Bonnie Banks of Lomond. I always thought that was a cheery sort of song, but I couldn't have been more wrong. It was written by a Jacobite Scot, jailed in an English prison. Facing death, he sang of taking the low road to Scotland, while his living companions took the high road. In other words, in dying, his spirit would reach Scotland afore ye. It can be heard playing in the background when Claire goes into the big dinner at Leoch. It's an ironic choice, since the song was written in 1746, three years after Claire fell through the stones. About the only thing producers used from Inverness for the series is its name. This is the real Inverness. Quaint Falkland and Fife was more suitable for the scenes walking through the town in days past. Not far from Inverness is one of the many standing stone centers in Scotland. At Clava Cairns, there are four cairns and three stone circles. It's believed the cairns were burial chambers some 4,000 years ago. The main passageways into the cairns glow with the midwinter solstice sunset. Although nothing much looks familiar here for Outlander fans, who have seen the show's Craig the Dune Circle, there is one flat stone, and it's the most important to the storyline. I'm not sure why this circle is billed as the inspiration for Craig the Dune. Even the scenery around it is not similar. That part was shot in the mountainous Rannoch Moor in Perthshire. My skeptical mind thinks it might have something to do with being only about six miles from the infamous Culloden battlefield and so kind of good to cash in on for ta tourism dollars. Culloden Moor is where the last battle fought on British soil occurred, the turning point in Highland history and the end of the Jacobites. The battle lasted less than an hour. 1,500 were slain. 1,000 of them were Jacobites. The field is virtually unchanged from the time of the battle. Prominent in the field now, though, is a 20-foot high, 18-foot round old stone memorial carn. Carns were used as a means to keeping track of how many entered a battlefield. Each man dropped a stone onto a pile and took one when he came off the battlefield. However many left tallied how many had died. The last owner of the field 
Duncan Forbes, erected the Kern and about 25 clan grave markers in 1881 to mark the clans who fell here. It is believed, though, that there were even more clans involved. While many Scots died, their leader did not. Bonnie Prince Charlie escaped, disguised as a serving girl, and made it to the Atlantic coast with a stop on the Isle of Skye before heading out to France. Skye's role in the saga was immortalized in song in 1884. Speed, bonny boat, like a bird on a wing. Onward, the sailors cry. Carry, the lad that's born to be king, over the sea to sky. In 1892, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote his own version of the Sky Boat Song and changed the first line to sing, to say, sing me a song of a lad that is gone. In 2014, Bear McCrary changed it again to sing me a song of a lass that is gone. Say, could that last be I? Merry of soul, she sailed on a day over the sea to sky, which is the series theme song. Not all clans were decimated at Culloden. The Campbells, who had fought on the side of the English, continued to flourish. When an act of prescription against the wearing of the Scottish tartan was enacted in 1746, the Clam Campbells' black watch tartan was the only allowed exception. Torquil Ian Campbell, the 13th Duke of Argyll, still lives in the family home of the Clan Campbell in Inverary. The foundation stone for this castle was laid in 1746, just after Culloden. There are many Outlander references to the clan. In one case, Jamie talks about taking a longer route to skirt around Campbell land. Part of the castle is open to the public, but in the castle's private section, the current Duke and Duchess raise their three children. Each room on the public side is exquisitely detailed. You come into a small entry room, but then the next room, the armory hall, literally takes your breath away. Passing through an arch, your gaze wanders up and up till you realize the artful display is actually swords and other instruments of killing. The almost 70 foot tall room is believed to be the highest ceiling in Scotland. The saloon, technically at the rear of the house but originally intended to be the main entranceway, has as much modern history as ancient. Followers of the popular period program Downton Abbey may recognize it as the setting for the family's entrance in the Christmas 2012 show. A piano sits off to the side of the room, but it has a history all its own. It was at this piano that the famous duo of Lerner and Lowe, guests of the 12th Duke, tickled the ivories and came up with some of their most famous songs, those for the musical My Fair Lady. A young harpist suffered a gruesome death and now reportedly haunts the room trimmed in traditional black watch tartan. It is said a harp can be heard playing when a family member is about to die. One of Outlander's biggest stars is the landscape of Scotland itself. This is where nature is stunning, like these falls on the Isle of Skye. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to that to always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. To see more of Scotland or any of my European destinations, go to my website. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. When libraries are again offering programs, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. Until then, visit the library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. Stay healthy, stay home, cheerio.